So I've spent the last couple of years writing this book and the initial uh, kind of spark of it, I guess, came from several different places. So partly it came from reading a lot of people who I really admire, like Bill McKibben and Naomi Klein and people who kept saying climate change is a failure of the imagination. And they would say that and then they would move off onto something else and leave me behind going, ah, what, uh, uh, that was inter what, what did you mean by that? That was really interesting. And then uh, in Lean Logic, David Fleming, who some of you may remember, David Fleming's book, he says, if we are to create a sequel to the market economy, it will be above all a work of the imagination. Uh, and I kept, and it kind of started to get under my skin. I read Susan Griffin, who said, one might say that human societies have two boundaries. One is drawn by the requirements of the natural world and the other by the collective imagination. And all of these sort of set me off on, th on this inquiry about what's the state of health of the, of the collective imagination of the world in which we're trying to do transition? And what is the connection between our ability to do transition effectively and the state of health of the imagination of the, of the, of the people around us and ourselves? So, um, so I want to start by, this is a few weeks ago in London at the Global and uh, I wasn't even intending to go there. I happened to be in London. I was in Westminster. I thought, oh, I've got two hours. Uh, I'll hop over to Westminster. And there was this extraordinary 100,000 people, mostly young people, all around Westminster, incredibly dynamic and energetic and passionate about climate change. And when I was there, I thought, what if this day today here now in this place is the day that historically we look back to as the tipping point that when we when we're able to look back over the over the whole climate change saga that we look back to that day as being the day when the direction started to tip and when the momentum started to build and that we allowed ourselves to to, to, to see that as the day when that happened because we're all too easy to rush into sort of uh, assuming everything's too late and that we've lost and, and so on and so on. But for me, it feels so important that we allow ourselves to imagine that, this, that these movements are actually successful and that we see these kind of tipping points uh, in the world around us. So I'm only going to show you one graph, I promise. The reason I like to look at this is because, not because of the numbers necessarily, but because of the story that it contains. So at the moment, we're here up at the very top, of this thing and we need to get right down to the bottom. It always feels to me and it always feels like it's underpinned our sort of thinking about the transition movement since the beginning that we're only going to make that journey if the stories we can tell about the lower half of that line are so delicious and enticing and wonderful and, uh, and gorgeous that actually that they create a really deep sense of longing in people, that that's where we want to go, that we'd be profoundly disappointed if we didn't actually live to see that uh, particular outcome. And I guess that's, uh, that, that's something that has always really underpinned what I've tried to do is, 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 to, is to convey that sense of, God, it could be so fantastic. We could create something so utterly remarkable and extraordinary. And at the moment, often when we try to motivate and, and mobilize and engage people, all too often we tend to use images like this which uh, work for some people, they work for me sometimes, but they certainly don't work for everybody. And I wonder whether actually there's something really powerful and exciting about the idea that we, uh, that we actually create a uh, sense of longing by images like this. This is a guy called James Mackay, who works in Leeds uh, at the university, and he draws the future. He's the man who draws the future. And it's a future, it's not a utopia, it's not perfect, but it's a future where we have thrown absolutely everything that we possibly could do at this problem. It's a, a future where we have mobilized social movements and resources and politics and planning and everything in the purpose of actually creating a, a net zero world in a way that is imaginative and creative and, and playful. This is his drawing of a, of a city where biodiversity 
is the center of everything, where we have created the most biodiverse cities uh, imaginable. This is his idea of what our cities would look like if our cities were full of food being grown everywhere. Our children's journey to school every morning was walking through gardens and food being grown. Because after all, once we get the cars out of our city, we have an enormous amount of space we need to do something with. Already in Paris, where they've been taking measures to try and reduce the amount of cars in Paris, they have a whole load of underground car parks people just don't use anymore. And the mayor of Paris is running competitions to come up with creative uses for these underground car parks. There was a piece on the BBC recently about one that was converted into uh, an amazing, massive underground mushroom farm in what had formerly been a car park. So, you know, we could get to a future where this is what, our, is what the streets of our cities look like. Sometimes people uh, say to me, well, this is all very utopian and fantastic in the sky and this this kind of stuff would never really work in the real world well you know one of the one of the beauties of the of the job work that i do in the transition movement is i get to go and visit loads of places where transition is happening there's so much stuff happening that we very rarely hear about but all over the world there is phenomenal stuff happening and just one little story of a place i went to last year this is in a, a place called mont in france which is about half an hour inland from nice and the French government about a few years ago said that 20% that of all the food served in schools should be organic food. And in Montsart too, they said, so if 20% is better for the kids than 0%, then why, why do we stop at 20%? Why don't we just go all the way up to 100%? So now in Montsart too, in all the schools in Montsart too, the food is 100% organic and 70% of that food is grown on a market garden uh, on the edge of the town, which was land bought by the municipality. It was going to have houses built on it. They bought it, they turned it into a four hectare market garden and orchard, just for the biggest chard I have ever seen in my whole life. Uh, just phenomenal. And when I was there, I met the mayor. They had this fantastic sort of goth mayor. He was, I've never seen quite such a sort of rock and roll mayor anywhere I've ever been to. And very sort of proudly showing me around this uh, this fantastic garden and I'm there thinking this is a win-win-win-win-win strategy here you've got it's good for public health mental health biodiversity local economy great for the kids great for the school great for absolutely everything and so many of the things that we need to do for me actually fall into that kind of a category they had this building where they were training kids from all the local schools how to grow, how to cook and when you went into the kitchen it wasn't like a sort of glass and steel Jamie Oliver type sort of cook a little cooker, uh, a worktop and a cupboard because they said that's what most of these kids have at home and so that's where we teach them to cook with all of this stuff. So, so for me the, what was so beautiful about going there was I could see something that has sort of been in my head for 12 or 13 years that I've been trying to communicate in different ways through the transition movement and through books and films and talks and everything. Actually I'm there walking around in it and it exists and it smells amazing and the bees love it and everyone's having a really great time and you think yeah this this stuff works so one of the things that kind of set me off with writing this book as well was that i read some research that was published in 2011 2010 by a researcher called kyung hee kim and uh, i interviewed her so all of the people that i interviewed for the book all of those interviews you can find at robhopkins.net so if you read the book and there's a couple of paragraphs from someone interesting and you think I'd like to know more about them then chances are that whole interview is there and a podcast of the conversation but she did some research in 2010 where she looked at this thing called the torrance test for creative thinking which is the main kind of creativity test that is done around the world and done in the us for since the 1960s her conclusion from looking at all of this data was that imagination and iq rose together until the mid 1990s and then iq kept rising and imagination went into what she called a steady and persistent decline. And when this was published, it made it onto the front page of Newsweek, as you can see here, and led to a whole big soul search in America. And people said, oh, what does this mean for economic growth? And what does this mean for Hollywood? But I never heard anyone in the climate change, social justice, uh, anti-globalization, whatever movement say, what does this mean for us? Because if we're living in a time when imagination is declining, 
and our ability to put things together in new ways. John Dewey described imagination as the ability to see things as if they could be otherwise. So if we are losing the ability to see things as if they could be otherwise, if we are kind of trapped in this sort of web of when Margaret Thatcher said there's no alternative, and we kind of believe that, Climate change is almost like the hideous, gruesome, logical outcome of Margaret Thatcher saying there is no alternative. Then that's really, really important because fundamentally what we're trying to do in the transition movement is to help people imagine something other than business as usual because business as usual is going to kill us all and destroy life on this planet. So if, if imagination is in decline, that's really, really important. So this evening is, you could think of this evening as being like a love poem to those two words, what if. And, um, uh, and so I have these uh, very nice cards, see, but you can see them on the screen. I use these in talk. So there are nine what if questions that are going to underpin this evening. And the first one is, what if play was at the heart of the everyday? So one of the things that that researcher said was, one of the reasons that she attributed this decline in imagination and creativity to was the decline of play. She said, we no longer have the kind of free, unstructured children just out on their own terms playing. I love this picture of the girl with the big shoes on. It kind of, it's kind of how I imagined my wife was at, at that particular age. And any of those of you know her might, might agree. Um, uh, because this kind of play, this kind of free, unstructured play is how children learn to cooperate, it's how they learn to manage conflict, it's how they learn to take risks. And when we produce a generation of children who can't take risks, we produce a generation of adults who can't take risks, which is the last kind of adults that we need at this time when, when we have to reimagine and rebuild everything. Movement. So um, one of the things when I was researching the book, I was really keen to find somewhere where people were intentionally trying to bring play back. You know, we've seen this decline of, uh, of, of, of children playing in the streets, which this sort of peaked, historians say, sometime in the mid 50s, and has kind of gradually declined since our streets have been kind of cleansed uh, of children playing. And now they're expected from the age of four to start compiling their CVs. And it's had a disastrous uh, impact, I think. So, I wanted to find out where are there people who are intentionally trying to bring it back. I went to Bristol, to uh, St George in Bristol, to go and visit a street that's part of something called Playing Out, which is a national network of people and communities where they close the street. Playing Out makes it so much easier for them to do that. They don't have to apply endless paperwork. They have one form, they took all the dates, they sent it in. There are 60 streets in Bristol where this happens. It's happening increasingly across the country. You need a couple of parents in high-vis jackets, uh, block the street. I went there on a Wednesday evening, the streets full of skipping and cycling and chalk drawing all over the pavement. It was just fabulous. And I spoke to one of the mums and she said, this is what happens when you get the cars out of the way. It's not that this is gone, but you have to get the, you have to get the cars out of the way and then this just uh, happens. She said, this is not anti-car, this is pro-community, which I really love. I spoke to one of the dads on the street who said, um, after a little while, we found that we actually quite liked each other. You know, they, they, they started meeting in each other's houses and having parties and things like that. So that was fantastic. And then I, uh, in Totnes, then when I was right researching this book, we had a festival of street games where we closed a square at the top of the town so that kids could uh, come and play and learn games from older people that used to be the games that filled the street. It was fantastic. Uh, I forgot how exhausting uh, until this particular occasion. One of the things that I loved from this was a game that I'd never heard of before that was a Dutch game called Spekerpupen, where you get a piece of string and you tie the piece of string around the back of your belt and then you hang it off there, you hang a screw and down to about there. And then you have to, uh, looking backwards between your knees, you have to try and get the screw so that it goes into the neck of the bottle. This little girl was doing this for about 10 minutes. If, you ever, if any of you are worried about your children or your grandchildren and their attention spans, this game is just absolutely perfect. Uh, you could, or you could try it at work even, you know, it might work really well there. But more and more, play is something that we buy for our children. And this is this uh, horrific thing called Hello Barbie, which sort of now accompanies me when I go around giving my talks. Because uh, Hello Barbie was the first uh, Wi-Fi enabled smart doll in the world. 
which was a toy which would have conversations with your child and would um, uh, ask your child questions and have conversations and then would record all the answers and use it to build a detailed marketing profile of your child, which Mattel could then uh, sell on to other companies. This hideous, hideous thing was uh, luckily almost, uh, they, the, the sales were only 10% of what they were hoping for because there was a campaign in the US by an organization called the Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood who uh, ran a campaign called Hell No Barbie, which ended up meaning that they, they lost 90% of their sales, which means what I always wanted to do when I do talks now is to be able to interview Hello Barbie live on stage for her, for her views on the imagination and the erosion of the imagination in our culture in 2019. But the app has been discontinued, so I can't actually do that. But there is a lovely quote from the script, which you can get hold of, which was a script where she says, so now that we've been and used our imagination and played games, let's get serious and talk about something really important, fashion. I'll have a like that. So luckily, uh, yeah, as I said, this was this is now kind of gone, really, I suppose. It took can be quite a while to find one of these on eBay. But uh, there's a German version called My Friend Kayla that the German government classified as illegal espionage apparatus uh, and for fine parents if they actually uh, turn these things on. So I was really interested to see if I could find places where play was something that was... Uh, back into politics where were there politicians who who made room for play and this amazing guy here is called Antanas Mokos and he was the mayor of Bogota and he actually ran to be elected dressed like this and uh he was a great believer that play and politics really needed each other he said here's what I learned people respond to humor and playfulness from politicians it's the most powerful tool for change we have and uh when he was elected as the mayor of Bogota he did many extraordinary things. One of my favorites was that Bogota had the most corrupt traffic police and the highest rate of deaths on the roads of the city of Bogota. So he sacked the entire traffic police department. Instead, he hired 400 mime artists who stood on every intersection, red and yellow cards like referees. And if the cars were badly behaved, they'd get shown a red card. And he said, that this is one thing that Colombians fear more than the traffic police, it's creation. He said to all the traffic police who lost their jobs, they could have their jobs back if they would retrain to be mime artists. I would just so love to live in a world where that happened uh, more often. So finding a way to bring play back into what we do and into transition is, is so, so important. And we had a beautiful event at Battersea Arts Centre uh, in which transition tooting were, were, were really, really central a couple of weeks ago where we had couple of hundred people playing in the hall, building physically out of cardboard, the future that we want to create. And it kind of affects and reaches people so much deeper than just talking about ideas and, 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 and using PowerPoints and stuff. Bringing play into what we do is really, really important. So my second what if question for you lovely people is what if we considered a healthy imagination vital to our health? So all too often we think of the imagination as being like a, a sort of a, a nice luxury, a nice sort of it's a pudding that we have after our meal of doing all the sort of serious proper stuff. We might have a little bit of imagination, like a sort of a nice little bit of chocolate at the end. Imagination is essential and vital to our lives as healthy human beings. This is a part of your brain called the hippocampus. This is important extraordinary part of your brain this is where your memory and your imagination fire from so whenever you are being imaginative whatever networks are firing have the hippocampus center the thing that's most interesting about the hippocampus is that it is the part of the brain that is uniquely vulnerable to cortisol so when we get stressed or anxious or when we're traumatized it can shrink by up to 20 percent and when it shrinks we lose that ability to <clears throat> think about the future in positive hopeful ways and we tend to get stuck kind of down into the present which really sort of feels like where we are more widely really so i was really interested to see if i could find a place where they were intentionally creating the conditions for the hippocampus to grow back again and uh, i went to dundee to visit this uh, extraordinary place called art angel uh, on the first floor office block in the centre of Dundee. Uh, this is a woman called uh, Rosalie Summerton, who's just brilliant. And what they've done in effect in, in, in this office block is to create what I like to think of as a campus for the hippocampus. They are a place where people who are uh, 
uh, who sort of decide that they, they, this is what they need or whose doctors decide this is what they need, go along, they say, when you walk through the door here, you're not a client or a patient, you're an artist preparing work for an exhibition. And we will help you with that. We have everything you need. We have tea and biscuits and a shoulder if you need it. And, and it was just extraordinary. I spoke to so many people there and you could see them in the process of their hippocampus uh, kind of growing back again. They were starting to be able to think about and see the future for the first time in years. They were starting to sort of, they were kind of reimagining who they were. I spoke to one guy who worked for 30 years in local government and then had really bad burnout. I said, so do you think of yourself as an artist? And he paused for a bit and said, aye, why not? You know, so it was a place where people were sort of rediscovering and, and reimagining themselves. I spoke to one woman who said she spent, she spent uh, the previous four years in her pajamas and she'd come that, that close six months ago to taking her own life. Even though she had two small children, she said, here, I can see the future coming back again. I can see uh, where I'm going. Every year at Art Angel, they do an evaluation to see how they're doing, where they give people a sheet with two outlines of a person and they say, fill one in to show how you were before you came here and the other to show how you are now you've been here for a little, now you've been coming here for however long. And it was a very, very moving going through the pile of them. And I just want to show you one, which for me, really captured how extraordinary the work they do there is, but also kind of captures the journey that collectively we need to be going on over the next 10, 15 years. What if we followed nature's lead? Most of the great imaginative people in our culture and in our history get a lot of that inspiration from nature, from spending time in nature. Nature is one of the things that really feeds and fires uh, our imagination on, on many, many levels. There's fascinating research about how the more time we spend in nature, uh, the more imaginative we are, the more empathic we are, the more generous we are. Uh, experiencing the kind of awe that we experience in nature also makes people much more uh, generous and, 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 and kind. Uh, and I think there's something really important about the link between nature and imagination in that we are living in a time where during my lifetime, we've lost 60% of all the creatures that we share this. Michael McCarthy calls the great thinning that we're living in. Uh, and uh, René Dubot, the microbiologist, used to say, if we lived on the moon, our imagination would be as barren as the moon. So if we're living in a time where we know that that diversity uh, is shrinking, that richness is shrinking, I think that's one of the things that has a knock-on impact in terms of the shrinking of the hippocampus. That sort of knowing in the background that this kind of, uh, this hideous uh, contraction is just sort of motoring forward is one of the things that someone I interviewed in a book who calls it pre-traumatic stress disorder. This kind of uh, living in a time of the great thinning takes a toll on our, uh, uh, on our uh, hippocampus. And actually, even if, even if we try to ignore it's happening, that also takes a toll because it takes a lot of energy to try and ignore the fact that that is happening. One of the loveliest uh, projects that I've seen trying to do something about this is the National Park City project in London. Uh, and uh, Daniel Raven Ellison, who did this, is, is, appears in the book a few times. He's a, geolog a geographer. He calls himself a guerrilla geographer. He went off around, took his son to visit all the national parks in the UK, came back, made this map of London. This is a map of London just showing the green spaces and the blue spaces. When he did that, he realized that 49.5% of London was green space and blue space. So he reasoned, if we could just make another half a percent, then the majority of London would be green space and blue space. So London would be a national park. Uh, so, and it was a, it's such a beautiful project because in order to do that, it means one square meter for every person in London needs to go from tarmac or concrete to, to green or blue. So it's a beautiful what if question. Everybody can, can think about, well, where would I do mine? And it's a whole movement that's been rooted in what if. They do all these beautiful what if questions like, what if the rivers in London were so clean you could swim to work? What if the bird song was so loud that it drowned out the traffic? And in July, Sadiq Khan designated London as a national park. Uh, and it's a beautiful example of a what if question. But we'll come back to what if questions later. 
And this is an amazing woman who's one of my heroes called Daria Robinson in Richmond in California. And she runs a project called Urban Tilth, working with young people in a very poor neighborhood, very tough part of town. Um, and she, uh, she teaches young people to grow food. In the last 15 years, they've started 13 gardens and farms in Richmond with the aim of growing 5% of Richmond's food. She's amazing. And I, and I wanted to know from her, how has she seen now having 15 years worth of young people in that place go through this thing of learning how to grow food, to connect with the soil, to work with the seasons, to feel a pride uh, in growing beautiful produce uh, to feed their community. How has she seen that have a knock-on impact to the imagination of people in that place? And she said to me, when she grew up there, everybody wanted to leave. Nobody wanted to stay there. She said, now I hear a lot more people saying, I want to live here. I want to be able to afford to buy a house and make my life here. They're dreaming out all kinds of other new things and feeling like it's totally within the realm of possibility. So whether it's about getting people to nature or bringing to nat nature to where they are, if we want to see a kind of a rebooting of our collective imagination, nature is utterly essential to that. What if we fought back to reclaim our attention? There's a big and very powerful link, I think, between uh, attention and imagination. If we're unable to focus our attention span on anything, then it makes it really hard to be imaginative. Art, in many ways, is kind of distilled attention. I like to always story about, if you imagine Vincent van Gogh in 1888 coming into the room, his room in the, in the yellow house in Arles, carrying a big bunch of sunflowers, and he sits down in front of a little wooden table and he arranges the sunflowers uh, in a little earthenware pot on the table and he sits back as the sun streams in through the windows and lights up these beautiful flowers and he looks at them and then he gets out his smartphone and he thinks oh I'll just check my uh, my uh, Instagram page and my Facebook page and my Twitter and uh, and then two and my email and then two hours later he's watching videos of skateboarders falling downstairs and can't even remember how he got there you know then we wouldn't have this and all of the impact that that has had down over generations would have been completely lost when we are in a time when it's so so hard for us to actually be able to bring our attention span to things because of these very very powerful devices we carry around in our pocket which uh, which are um, competing very much with our ability to focus on anything uh, I think it makes it much, much harder for us to be imaginative. They steal the time when we could be daydreaming and looking out the window and sketching and coming up with ideas. We, we, we waste that time scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. I spoke to a guy called Dr. Larry Rosen, who does a lot of research about the impact that smartphones have on our, on our attention span. And he told me, imagination is taking things from various places in your brain, things you've heard, things you've done, things you've thought, and putting them together in unique but valuable ways. We don't have the attention span to do that anymore, and it's not just young people. I would argue that imagination is on the decline exactly in the opposite trend to our time spent on smartphones. So, so uh, and part of that, I think, is because we are terrified of being get into a lift that goes up more than three floors and out come everybody's phones rather than everybody thinking, oh, time for a conversation or, oh, I could, uh, oh, I wonder what I might do when I get outside or, you know, it's, it's, we, if, if we, a culture that is vibrantly imaginative is a culture that is able to sustain its attention. I noticed it in myself when I sat down to write this book. I had big piles of things I needed to read, books and papers and stuff. Page one was okay, page two was okay. By page three, there's a part of my brain fires up going, oh, maybe you should just check your Twitter feed. Uh, you know, it's really, really difficult to, 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 to keep imagination going under those circumstances. What if school nurtured young imaginations? What if we had an education system which, uh, which people left at 18 with their imagination honed like a superpower? I think we have an education system in the first place. And this is, uh, as part of the book, in the, the, the chapter which addresses that question, uh, I have to say, having written a number of essays, another, a number of books with bits about climate change and reading climate science, actually redoing the research around the education system in 2019 and its impact on the attention span was almost equally as depressing, actually creating the conditions that we create uh, for 
imagination is just heartbreaking. And so in the book, there's a whole load of different schools that I talk to around the world who are putting the imagination central to what they do, saying our primary role as a school is to create really, really imaginative kids. And all of those places talked about this place in this picture as being their kind of ideal. And this is in Italy in a place called Reggio Emilia, where in 1945, at the end of the war, all they had left was a tank and six trucks, three trucks and six horses. And they sold those things to build a school based on the idea of how do we create a system of education that will ensure that fascism never happens again. And central to what they do is that at the heart of every school is an atelier, a workshop, where someone will help you make whatever you want to make, whenever you want to make it. Uh, so making is fundamentally at the heart of everything. And they don't teach by subject, they teach by project. And they have a beautiful philosophy for how they think about kids. They, they talk about young people as being beautiful, powerful, competent, creative, curious, and full of potential and ambitious desires and authors of their own learning. I never went to a school that looked at me like that. Uh, and I think there are very few schools where that is the case. So I speak to, in the book, I, there's an amazing school in, in Brazil, which is inspired like that, which has a circus big top at its heart. There's all kinds of different stories in there. One of my favorites is very, very close to where I am. This is the, the Plymouth School of Creative Arts. Plymouth Art College noticed that young people were coming to the school, to the college. They would say, we love it here. Why, why do you love it so much? And they would say, we spent the last 12 years trying to pass tests. And guess what the answer in our teacher's head is? This is the first creative thing we've done in that whole time. So they started thinking in the art college about how could we create a school that goes from four to 16 that is designed and runs like an art school? It's such a beautiful question. How could schools be like art schools and be designed and work like art schools. Originally, they wanted to do it in an empty department store in the center of Plymouth, but that wasn't, that didn't end up being possible. So their brief to the architects was no corridors, no room that resembles a cell designed for 30 inmates, specialist performance and studio spaces. We want it totally accessible to an inner city neighborhood. Given that we can't have the department store, build us a department store that we can occupy as a school. But when you arrive downstairs, there's an atelier when you come in. It's a food atelier where kids learn how to cook and cooking and food is at, the, is at the heart of what the school is all about. The classrooms are like this. The classrooms are like studios in an art school. Uh, uh, it feels really, really different to, to, to normal school. One of the things that I loved was that they have a, a sports hall upstairs, which they make available to the local basketball team for free in exchange for them coming in and doing literacy with their, with their year two, uh, youngest kids in school. They say there's something really lovely about seeing six foot six, two foot two. Uh, but there's lots and lots of stories in the book about actually what education would look like if it fired. What is storytelling? Uh, was able to bring a positive future to life. If we, were, we became brilliant at telling the sort of stories about the future, uh, like in those pictures that I showed you at the beginning, if every conversation that we had about the state of the world and what needs to happen and every kind of tell the truth conversation we have about climate change and the situation in the world also included us telling stories about actually what it's still possible that we could create. These two people are from the University of Plymouth, Jackie Andrade and John May. Uh, you can read their interview on the blog. Brilliant. They came up with this thing called functional imagery training. They use the imagination and the power of imagination to help people make real change in their lives. So people who uh, uh, have things they want to change, where they drink too much or eat too much or they, whatever is the problem, they, 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 they work with them to use their imagination in a multi-sensory way. They get them to imagine if they had made those changes in their lives, what would it smell like and feel like and sound like? And what would it, what would it feel like to be running under the trees and feel the sunlight on their skin? What would it feel like to step out of the shower after you've really exercised for the first time? And they build what they call memories of the future, really powerful multi-sensory imaginings of how the future could be if we made the changes that we need to make. 
And what they find is that people then make those changes and then they stick with those changes because when things come in that could be, could sort of take them off target, they're not interested because they've got a North star now. They're going in that direction and the results they have are just extraordinary. And I think that idea of memories of the future applies just as much to the work that we do with climate change and with transition uh, as it does to the work that they do. This is the guy, James Mackay, who I spoke about at the beginning, who did those drawings of the future. This is when he goes out in Leeds and sets up an easel by the side of the uh, street in a particular place, and he starts to draw what's in front of him. And as people walk past, he stops them and says, excuse me, how do you think this place could be in the future? And then he adds that in as he goes along. And he says, um, all you need is a really simple sketch to have those conversations with people about how the future could be. All you need is a really basic, simple sketch, and it unlocks uh, all of that conversation. <clears throat> and I think that arts, in all of their uh, infinite variety, have such an important role to play in helping us to become better storytellers of what the future could be. Because it's not just about what it would look like, it's also about what it would feel like. What would it feel like in 2030 if we had achieved being a zero carbon uh, nation? in a way that we, that we talk about in the transition movement. What would it be like if we actually got there? And how do we, how do we capture that? And one of the lovely examples that I found is that Quentin Blake, the illustrator who I adore, uh, did a whole series of murals in a maternity hospital in Angers in France. And uh, he said they were a celebration of what's going to happen and a reassurance that that's what's going to happen. So how do we use the arts to, to, to do that in relation to transition? I was going to show you three of those murals that he did because I think they're so gorgeous. He tells a beautiful story about how the hospital administrator said, we need to meet. And he went into this meeting thinking, oh my God, he's going to tell me the budget's been cut and there's no money. And he said this very stern faced administrator said, the most important thing about this project is the exchange of looks between the mother and the So what if we started asking better questions? And that's kind of what, what, what I think of as what if questions. The ability to ask a really, really great what if question is one of the things that I love seeing when I visit different transition group projects that have a really great what if question. And having those spaces where people can come together to ask what if questions, kind of what if spaces. There are so few of those kind of spaces in life in 2019 that doesn't really happen in school, doesn't really happen in university, doesn't really happen in most people's work lives. Actually, those kind of spaces that transition groups hold to say what if are absolutely crucial. So I want to tell you three what if stories, one of which actually some of the people who are watching this could probably tell far better than me uh, because they actually did the project. But this is uh, the Tooting Twirl from uh, whenever it was, a couple of years ago in Tooting, where uh, Tooting doesn't have a village green or a town square or a shared kind of public space, it has a big busy road and lots of shops and not much like that kind of where people can meet. There's one place it could be, which is a bus turning circle, which is normally just full of buses with their engines idling, awful air quality, horrendous. You would never normally stop there, but it would be perfect. So Transition Tooting spent a day where they said, what if this was our village green? They filled that bus, but they got the ball of buses to go somewhere else. And they filled that space with grass on the ground and flowers and the smell of coffee and music and conversation and a carnival and it was just beautiful and it was a lovely day and loads of people came out and uh, and what I noticed as the day went on was that the conversation started to move from if this was our village green to when this is our village green it was like somewhere deep underneath the kind of permission started to shift the expectation started to shift. It was beautiful. I managed to, I got to sit with my feet on the green, green grass of tooting uh, in the sunshine. And I noticed that people, there's this wall here, the wall of Primark that normally you would never stop to look at. Uh, and people spent a day looking at this wall. And I heard a few people saying, when this is our village green, what will we paint on that wall? What story about ourselves will we paint on that wall? felt to me so powerful that creation that holding of that what if space moving from an if to a when uh, was really really beautiful 
This is uh, a couple from Walthamstow in uh, London called Hilary Powell and uh, Dan Edelstein. He's a filmmaker, she's a printmaker. And in their community, they were really uh, upset about the impact that austerity was having on their community. And they were, they were really troubled about particularly debt and seeing the rise of debt and the impact of debt uh, in their community. So they took over an empty bank their high street the last bank on their high street which had closed and they started printing these they started printing these banknotes now these these are not a local currency these are limited edition uh, signed artworks that came in different denominations these are the five pound ones because i'm a cheapskate but they also did 10 20 and, and 50 notes and the characters on the notes were really important so uh, these are the two steves who uh, run a project keeping young men out of gangs this is Tracy, who is the head teacher at the local primary school, who lost all of their funding for the arts, every single penny. This is Sarah, whose family feed 200 people two meals a day free uh, themselves. And this is a guy called Gary, who mortgaged his house in order to turn his garage into a, uh, into a food bank. And so the idea was they wanted to sell 50,000 pounds worth of these notes, which they did. And then uh, half of the money was then distributed between these four charities. Uh, and I spoke to Sarah about it because she was there when I went there. She was gold foiling the notes with her face on. I said, what does it mean to you being part of this project? She said, for us, this is like Christmas. They also produced these bonds as well, uh, which are rather lovely. And then they used the other £25,000 to go to the secondary debt market and buy back £1.2 million worth of payday lending debt which you buy a spreadsheet of all the people in Walthamstow with payday lending debt. And then they canceled that debt. They wrote to everyone and said, your debt is now canceled. Uh, and then they invited all of those people. They said, you don't owe us anything. Good luck to you. But if you'd like to come to an event that we're doing uh, in May on a, on a piece of waste ground overlooking Canary Wharf, you're very welcome. So people turned up, there was this van, this gold van, was full of bits of paper with debt written on it and then as part of the kind of climax of the whole thing they blew this van to pieces uh i think as kind of the climax of the film and uh and then collected up all the pieces from the explosion and all the people who bought bonds got sent things like this so this is uh some little bits of the broken glass presented like some very kind of precious artifacts this is a, a bit of the metal uh, likewise presented and then they collected up all of the metal the explosion of the car and melted it down to make these commemorative coins uh, and I just love that idea you know they could have just started a petition they could have just you know started an online campaign about debt uh, and you know that's not to demean online campaigns about debt but actually what they created was in their community a place where people could open most nights that it was open regularly for talks about debt uh, talks about the financial system when you went in the notes were hanging up like washing uh, they said people seem starved of making, which I really remember. You know, there's something powerful about a project that puts the imagination and making at the heart of it. The last what if story that I want to share is from Liège in France, where Liège en Transition, I went there five years ago, they were really active and they had a project they called Centure Alimentaire, which means food belt, where they said, what if in a generation's time, the majority of food eaten in Liège came from the land closest to Liège? Such a beautiful question. So simple, so uh, opens up so many possibilities for so many people to step in and say, I have a piece of that. So I went there and they had an event that was where they launched this. And there were farmers and chefs and baristas and academics and anyone who cared about food came to this event. Then I didn't hear anything for a while. I went back. In that time, they'd started 21 new cooperatives and they raised 5 million euros of investment from local they started two vineyards, two farms, a brewery, uh, these shops called Les Petits Producteurs, you can see at the bottom there, which means the small producers, where they just put the food from farmers out in boxes, sell it for what the farmers want it to be sold for, tell the story about the farmer and, and, and where it came from. The first shop they opened within six months, it was doing so much better than its best case scenario. They opened another one. Now they've opened a third. Now the first one has doubled in size. They have a pedal powered delivery business. They have a local currency that runs between all these different things. For me, it's always very kind of um, emotional going to visit a project like that because, because I've spent the last 10, 12 years with this kind of vision in my head about, 
sort of more local connected, resilient, diverse economies and how they might be. And when you go to Liège, it exists, it works, it's running. I have, you go and have your lunch in it. You go out for it in the evening. I met the mayor of Liège who said, this is now the story of our city. Uh, he said, we see our role as just being to remove all the blockages to this happening. And, uh, we, and uh, all the land that we own around the city we're making available to Centure Alimentaire to, to grow food on. It was just absolutely magic. But it started with a really great what if question, which made a, when I spoke to Christian Jornet, who runs the project, he said, uh, we had a really strong narrative. We had a really strong narrative. And the guy you see at the top of the picture there is called Pascal Hennen, who manages these shops. And he said to me, uh, I said, so how far can this go? And he said, I think when we have 12 or 13 shops, the supermarkets will start to fragilize. It's a beautiful word to have in French, fragilize. The supermarkets will start to fragilize. Not we have to campaign and, and demonstrate and try and bring down supermarkets. You build something better and more delicious that creates more longing. And that's how you do it. And that's really what they're doing in Liège that's so amazing. So the penultimate what if question for you is possibly the hardest one to imagine in Britain in November 2019, is what if our leaders prioritise the cultivation of imagination? The, 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 so the what, the what if questions is really about what we from the bottom up can do, how we can use what if to unlock uh, change in a way that, 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 that other ways maybe don't do. But this is about what does it look like if the people in charge say actually imagination is really important every government that's elected says we have a national innovation strategy but i would say to people innovation and imagination are actually quite different things innovation is something you do when the fundamental model works okay imagination is what you do when you have to rethink uh, the, the, the the model because it's not working i think it's a bit like pizza you know i say it's like with pizza you can innovate with pizza because by pizza fundamentally works and is really great and we all understand it and everybody loves pizza and you don't you can innovate with pizza with different toppings and different cheese you don't need to reimagine pizza because that would be a bit daft because pizza is great but actually neoliberal growth-based economics are not like pizza you know where they are when they're pushing us over a cliff at great pace then we need imagination really rather than we need innovation so how do we prioritize culture to create the best conditions in which the imagination can really flourish and you know the aim of this of this um webinar or whatever it is called is not to uh, offer a, a position one way or the other on brexit but i would say that actually as a, in terms of designing a process to exclude the imagination we couldn't have really done any better than we did when we designed uh, or when the government designed the brexit referendum ireland when they have big complex things they need to decide like that. They use deliberative democracy, citizens assemblies, where people are picked to represent their peers, and then they act in a way where they digest and they inform, and then they come up with suggestions which the government uh, agrees to accept. And these kind of things create a much, much better set of uh, circumstances for the imagination to flourish. This is in Barcelona, where thanks to the municipalist movement and the, that started with the 15M movements occupying the squares in 2010, they now have a, a model of democracy where they have neighborhood assemblies all across the cities who meet and who make policy recommendations to the city. As a result of which, Barcelona is now, I would say, one of the most progressive, interesting, imaginative uh, cities in the world uh, because they've created a good democratic foundation in which the imagination can flourish. How could we create an economic framework in which the imagination can flourish? It won't be much news to you as transition people, you know, but I, I would say one of the ways that we do that is by having an economic model where we get money to see and circulate locally as much as possible, to pass between every different place as many times as possible before it leaves, and uh, which is what they're doing so beautifully in Preston, with the Preston model where they look at the universities and the hospitals and organizations as being the places that are the anchors for this where the money circulates uh, and that creates so much opening for the imagination and people to step in with new models and new possibilities so creating those kind of economic frameworks in which the imagination is invited and flourished is really important too and i was really intrigued to say where could i find politicians who valued imagination 
in their work and who invited the imagination in what they were doing. So the woman here holding the microphone is an incredible woman called Gabriela Gomez Mont in Mexico City. And she formulated this thing for Mexico City that was conceived as being a ministry of the imagination. It sounds like something out of Harry Potter. If you go to Mexico City, they have a ministry of the imagination. It's actually called the Laboratory for the City. It's made up of 29 people, who uh, 30 people maybe, who half of whom are the kind of people you would have in town planning, like road transport planners and architects and stuff. The other half are creative people, poets, filmmakers, writers. And together they, they, they play this role of kind of being the guardians of the imaginative life of the city. And Gabriela said to me, imagination is not a luxury. We should not only be thinking about building cities for the human body, but also for the human imagination. The more we distribute the capacity to imagine different futures, the better off we will be. And in Bologna in Italy, which is just an idea I, I love, and I only heard about this two weeks before I handed in the very final manuscript of the book. So I was delighted that this, I, that this project came to me when it did. They have a thing called the Civic Imagination Office, where they noticed after a while that they were seeing a decline in uh, people engaged in, in scale. People were voting less. It was very bureaucratic if people wanted to actually do anything and make any kind of projects happen. So they created a Civic Imagination Office, which works like a transition group. There are six of them in different neighborhoods around the city. They're funded by the government, uh, by the city government. They are trusted by the municipality to get on and do things. They are trusted by the people in the neighborhoods and they run open space and visioning and different exercises to get people thinking about what could happen in this place. The key difference is that when they come up with a great idea, they then sit down and say, the municipality says, okay, um, we will offer this, this and this, if you will offer that and that, good, okay, can we do this? Are we gonna make this happen? Good, all right, so we'll create a pact. And they create a pact together. So the imagination that comes up from, the, from underneath is not just sort of patronized or dismissed or kind of ignored or devalued by the municipality. It's really valued and they create a pact. In the last five years in, in Bologna, they've created 500 pacts that range from growing a bit of food on a street or putting in new benches, up to taking an old uh, empty office block and turning it into a, a place to train young people to become classical musicians. The Civic Imagination Office in Bologna now is the main way the municipality allocates uses, in, interesting uses, for empty buildings. It's how they distribute participatory budgeting. It's a beautiful, every town, every city should have a Civic Imagination Office. It's such a beautiful, uh, piece that we could bring in and how would it be if we really recognized that we need to revalue the imagination if we enshrined the right to an imaginative life because if we look back to what I said at the beginning when we were talking about uh, about uh, how the imagination was uh, vital to our health if we actually look at austerity as having been a war on the imagination an assault on our collective imagination because it creates the perfect conditions for the hippocampus to shrink builds anxiety, it creates uh, more isolation, stress and loneliness at the same time as you're cutting funding for the arts and all kinds of creative stuff. Actually, if we were to have legislation that enshrined the right to imagine, that would be so wonderful. And there's a great template for that in Wales in the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. The way it works is it says every publicly funded organisation has to set out how it intends to achieve sustainable development. When you could take that model so easily and say every publicly funded organization has to set out how it's going to maximize the imaginative capacity of the people who work for it and the people it interacts with. Imagine how different the NHS would be, how different our education system would be if that was a, a, a really fundamental driver. It would also, I think, mean that you couldn't do austerity anymore because it would be seen as an assault on the collective imagination. So bring on the National Imagination Act. I say. So my very last what if question is, what if all of this came to pass? What would it be like to live in a time when the imagination ran wild? To live in a time when anything felt possible? And, uh, and I looked around when I was re uh, researching the book to try and see if I could find times in history when that was the case. And there are a few little bits and bobs of time. There was a time in Vienna, I think, I can't remember now, where, where they where they wrote, they crowdsourced their own constitution 
and then had a month-long street party to celebrate. One of my favorites is, is, the, is in 1968 in Paris and the student revolution in Paris, which is all about imagination, it's the power to the imagination, imagination taking power. It was a beautiful bit of oral history from Paris at the time where someone said, in that month of talking, you learned more than in your whole five years studying because you could talk to anyone and everyone. It really was another world, a dream world, perhaps. But that's what I'll always remember, the need and the right for everyone to speak. Talk to your neighbor was, uh, was graffiti that was sprayed around Paris. And this is kind of, for me, is, is, was a really interesting way of looking at what we do in the transition movement, is how do we create sort of now in, in 2019, immersive experiences where people can see and taste and, and feel part of a different way that the future could turn out to help them to create memories of the future. Whether it's small things like putting on events and raising awareness or running a potato day or taking over a local shop that's closed up to creating a community energy company, uh, you know, creating a whole new food system like they're doing in Liège, starting a, 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 a a building project, building houses to meet local needs. All of these things for me are, are really great works of the imagination because they're about bringing into the now the future that we can create in such a way that people can, can really interact with it. So this is just something to, 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 to close with, which is um, my uh, um, uh, uh, lodger in my house is a guy also called Rob who was studying at Schumacher College and he got a very early draft of the book and used it as a kind of foundation for the thesis that he wrote. He came up with this, which I thought was really smart, which we, which we kind of came up with together, but too late to go in the book. So it's kind of a sort of postscript, if you like, of actually what four things really create the conditions for the imagination to flourish. What does the imagination need if we're going to see a kind of renaissance of the imagination? So the first thing is space. And we all recognize in our own lives that imagination needs space. If our life is completely full and we're completely exhausted and overwhelmed, there is no space for the imagination. The imagination needs us to find space. Uh, and that could be on a, on a bigger scale through having a universal basic income, shorter working week, you know, or strategies that we devise in our own life where we find space, create space for the imagination. We need places. We need to create places uh, where people can come together that provide platforms for collective imagining. They could be outdoor spaces, they could be places we build, they could be places like the Tooting Twirl that kind of pop up and disappear again. They could be places that we build where people come together with that specific intention. But having those places is really important. We need practices, so things we do when we come together, like building a town out of cardboard boxes, like open space, like these different activities games, exercises, improvising, things like this, where people can come together uh, and have practices that, 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 that invite the imagination, re-familiarize ourselves with the imagination and with play. And lastly, we need pacts, because pacts is when this goes from us just all being kind of dreaming and being imaginative to being something really grounded, whether we're working in an organization, whether it's in our school, whether it's with our local government, we need the people who make decisions to agree and make pacts with what's coming out of that imagination. And then that's for me when it all gets really, uh, really exciting. So I just wanna close, and I've probably talked for too long, but hopefully you're all still there. Uh, um, I just want to close with uh, my favorite quote out of the book, which is the quote at the very beginning, which is by Neil Gaiman. And uh, he says, we all adults and children have an obligation to daydream. We have an obligation to imagine. It's easy to pretend that nobody can change anything that we're in a world in which society is huge and the individual is less than nothing, an atom in a wall, a grain of rice in a rice field. But the truth is individuals change their world over and over. Individuals make the future and they do it by imagining things can be different. Fantastic, oh my goodness. Should we just give Rob a bit of a round of applause for that? Amazing talk. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so, so much, Rob. Absolutely amazing. Um, so now we go into this section, harvesting not only all our thoughts and responses to that talk, but also the questions that people have submitted have popped in here, which are completely relevant to what we've just heard over the last 45 minutes. And I guess we're together till about 9.30. Um, so please do use the chat window 
uh, to pop your thoughts in, your responses, um, uh, and we'll just kind of tickle through these questions and see where the conversation takes us, uh, if, that's, if that's cool with everybody. Um, and the first question, it seems, that comes to mind after that, Rob, is if you remember back to before you started the project of writing the book, um, and now, how has that process changed your approach to creativity or your feeling about creativity? Um, I think it, I think it's given me uh, a lot more respect for how precious it is. Um, and, uh, you know, to, it was really interesting interviewing some of the people that I interviewed who were designers or poets or kind of really creative people. It was really interesting to hear the kind of hacks they've brought into their life in order to, in order to kind of ring fence their imaginative life. So there was one designer that I spoke to who said, basically, uh, I, I turn my, I turn the Wi-Fi off in my house at about eight o'clock in the evening and it doesn't go back on until midday the next day. And that and in the morning is when I get my most creative work done. That's my, that's my creative time. I, my phone is away. It's just me and, and, and paper and I go for a walk and that's when I get most of my really creative, so creative work done. So for me, there was a really, I spent the last year of doing this book just going back to having an old kind of Nokia kind of a brick phone and really trying to develop a very different kind of relationship with those sort of technologies. Uh, I also went and did a, I did a course with uh, Lucy Neal and uh, um, Ruth Bentovim and Anne-Marie Colhane uh, called The Art of Invitation that was just brilliant about, about bringing the arts and kind of artistic thinking into the work that we do uh, in transition in terms of designing events that kind of invite people to participate in a very different way than just having a really come and watch a film and then we'll have a conversation you know well actually how do we how do we bring that kind of creativity and play uh, and imagination into what we do uh, I think it really made me um, uh, recognize the value of of so I, I draw drawing is my thing and actually to to to, to to ring fence time for that kind of creative aspect of, of my life feels really important. And I realized that actually, which kind of, I would have known, but I never really thought about it, that, that, that most, of the, most of the breakthroughs and the insights from writing this book didn't come when I was sitting in front of a laptop. Most of the insights and realizations and creative spark moments came when I would go out on my bicycle and I would go out under the trees or I would go and do something else or I was, doing some weeding or washing up or something you know there's a a mathematician in there who talks about his 3b mantra which is that all the best ideas come when you're in the bath i can't remember what the other ones were in the bath not on the bog no, it was the, uh, <laughs> in the bath anyway whatever there were three b's but on his bicycle on the bus that was it not on the bog so he was so there was so there was that sort of side of it was really powerful for me was that idea that uh, that we that, that 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 if you don't value it and it feels to me like what's happening so much more widely. What I wanted to write, you know, quite often people who've written about it and reviewed it, they talk about, oh, it's full of so many inspiring stories. And, and hopefully it is full of lots of inspiring stories. But there's a really important part of it for me, which is that this book is like a, is a kind of silent spring, but for the imagination. Because if we live in a time when we are giving so little value to the imagination. It's heartbreaking. I was at a friend's house recently who had read the book or was halfway through the book. And we were having a conversation with her daughter who was seven about, so how, what, how do, in your school, how do the teachers talk about imagination in your school? She said, oh, we had to do a creative writing project recently. And my friend uh, wrote, uh, wrote an essay and the teacher said, why did you write that in, in your story? And he said, well, I was using my imagination. And, and he got, and he got um, like punishment points or whatever. For that you know and uh and it, f it feels to me like if we don't if if it's the case that we've that, that since the mid 90s we've seen this decline in imagination then at what point does that become critical and i think actually you know at the, at the end of the book i talk about in fact i'll just read you that little bit because it's only a paragraph and it's really quite sort of sums up what i'm, what I'm thinking about um and, and 
we recognize that if a population isn't sufficiently nourished, we will see a decline in health and a rise in preventable illnesses. We recognize that if we fail to give a population a good education, it will fail to reach its potential. Yet the neglect of the imagination is generally overlooked, seen as a frivolous distraction from the overarching aim of building economic growth and technological progress. We saw in Reggio Emilia what the creation of a system of education designed specifically to prevent the resurgence of fascism would look like. And yet we have designed an education system which is almost exactly its opposite. We can see in Barcelona and other Spanish municipalist cities what a model of democracy that invites the imagination would look like yet in most other places we persist in moving further and further away from such a thing. We saw at Art Angel what an approach to mental health that puts safety, hope and imagination at its heart would look like. Yet most people's experience is just the opposite. Our imagination isn't accidentally dwindling, it has been co-opted, suffocated, corrupted, and starved of the oxygen that it needs. And I think that that for me was the was, was the main, you know, I thought actually this is like I, I feel like Rachel Carson writing Silent Spring, but I just hope I've written it soon enough. Absolutely. And how and how do you think with that kind of realization of importance of creativity in our process? you know talking with a bit of an assumption that everyone on the call is is quite you know quite involved locally in starting projects and starting things and working in a transition town type setting if it, even if it's not called a transition town what what kind of advice could you give us to get our communities into first gear in terms of the imagination into practicing creativity where we are when perhaps we as you said about Twitter and Facebook and all of that, you know, we're very distracted by all of that, all of that, all of that stuff. You know, yes, we have promoted our event because we put it out on all of those platforms. What would be, if there any key realizations when you're writing the book about how to get communities into first gear? Not that there isn't any imagination in communities there already, but how, how can we practice that as transition towns in the UK? Uh, I think most, uh, most transition groups, that I go in and visit are are kind of quite good at that, you know. That that actually, you know, certainly in Transition Network, all of the resources that we, you know, all of the kind of insights and learnings that we distilled down into that this into the essential guide to doing transition is is very much about that. How do you design events where where the invitation is really exciting and and and, and bright and and feels kind of. Uh, feels hopeful and positive how do you then facilitate an event where you don't just dump loads of depressing information on people where they walk through the door and then send them off on their own at home to go and sort of weep into their into their digestive biscuits when they get home you know how do we actually have an event where people digest stuff together and 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 it's in a context of what if and it's in a context of right let's meet next saturday and go and do something and, and plant something you know that, that that bit of it feels really feels like that's always kind of been in the in the DNA of it. I suppose. I mean, one of the one of the things that that, that doing the art of invitation course with Ruth and Lucy uh, and Anne Marie got me think got me really thinking about was about how you how you invite people to things. That actually there was a thing there where they said any big impactful event that you want to do that's really a what if event that is inviting people's input and consultation you know you should put 40 percent of the energy of the event should go in before the event to how you invite people to that event to make sure that you get a real kind of spread of, of people in in the room so it's not just the usual people but you really invite people to feel really welcome to come to the event 20 percent of the thing is the event itself and then the other 40 percent then is kind of digesting what happened and how you present what happened and how you how you kind of put that back out there which was a way of thinking that, that that I hadn't really kind of come across before and it was just brilliant I think um, so uh, and I guess I guess as well I would I, th I think that thing I showed at the end the space places practices and, and um, packs thing for me it was a, was 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 a really interesting useful way of looking at it um, yeah cool yeah. And, it, and it makes me think about that idea of that came up a lot in the in in the questions that people wanted to ask about the balance of um a feeling of urgency or increased urgency over time with processes that you're talking about that need relationship building and need 
a bit of patience along alongside it as well. How do you see kind of transition towns, the transition movement and transition practice um, relating to that sense of urgency? You know, how do you know this idea of rapid transition, this idea of we've got 10 years left, you know, this sense of urgency, how does that sit with you? Uh, I think I've, I've, I think I've always, since we started, I mean, I think I've, for me, transition came out of that deep sense of urgency and transition has always been underpinned by that deep sense. I've, I, I never detect any note of complacency uh, anywhere that I go. Uh, I do feel like, I feel like there's, the, the, there's something in there's something in the book uh, for me which is about how how do we the bit that feels like it's disappearing off and out of the conversations at the moment you know through the deep adaptation stuff and some of extinction rebellion is there's often this kind of narrative of of, of it's of it's too late and uh, collapse is inevitable and this kind of decline of everything is kind of inevitable and I was I saw a talk that Joanna Macy who most of you will have will have heard of I'm sure the amazing American uh, philosopher activist who came up with um, the work that reconnects and many other things I saw a talk recently that she gave and actually I felt I, I was I was kind of I loved Joanna to bits and I was a bit disappointed in that she did an exercise where she does a beautiful thing, which many of you will have done, I'm sure, if you've done inner transition stuff or even in your transition groups, you know, where open-ended questions. So you sit down with somebody else and you say, when I think about the, the, the impacts of climate change in the world around me, I feel. And then you pair up with somebody else and you have a conversation where you talk about that. So she was doing this with, uh, in this room full of people at this event. And she was, so the questions were, when I consider the inevitable collapse of our culture, I feel. And then people had this conversation. And then the next one was, when I consider uh, the uh, kind of inevitable onset of climate change, I feel. And, I've, and I was thinking, where's the question that says, when I think about the extraordinary social transformative period of time the next 15 years could be, the time when everything is reimagined and when we have a 2030 target which then knocks on through everything and we see a, a complete change of how we imagine cities and how we imagine transport then what do i feel you know what if, if but we exclude that, op, that 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 possibility out of the conversations and it feels so kind of irresponsible to me because it means that we we, we kind of have movements that are trying to do something but fundamentally don't believe they can ever succeed and i find that really kind of heartbreaking so uh but i've completely forgotten what your initial question was <laughs> that's all right i mean it's, <laughs> that's all right it was about kind of rapid transition yeah. to quickly and it's really interesting to hear that um perhaps feeling hopeful is one of those really key ingredients of that you know or, or acting with this sort of sense of intent that the future is going to be amazing you know this kind of thing is not a flippant thing to say i suppose that's why i'm getting from what you're saying i mean there's no guarantee you know i'm not saying hey the future is definitely going to be amazing but i'd say if we if we exclude the possibility from our narrative then it's definitely going to be really awful yeah yeah you know i would say martin luther king didn't stand up in 1963 and say i have a dream but actually maybe it's a bit late and do you know what actually it'd probably be a bit expensive and we don't want to upset any commuters and do you know what actually maybe we shouldn't bother do you know it's like actually the one of the guys i interviewed in the book a phenomenal guy from jackson mississippi called kalia kuno who runs a project called cooperation jackson who are just amazing and uh, he said to me something like we don't have the luxury of giving up here if we give up we are just steamrolled and that's it you know we are fighting off Kind of racism and, and and being steamrolled all the time and it's not it's not a luxury that we have really so i i kind of i kind of feel like that you know for, for me it feels like imagination you know there's an there's an exercise whenever i start talks and you know this might be something that some of you might find useful in your in work you do in your groups so i always start by saying i'm going to show you an object and you have a minute and a half with a partner find a partner you didn't know before you came and i'm going to show you an object and you have a minute and a half to come up with as many alternative uses for that object as possible. This is not school. There is no right answer here. 
there isn't you know you basically and, and you don't have to write them down just keep a kind of a tally roughly of how many ideas you came up with and then I show them like a, a paper coffee cup or I often I'd show them my shoe or something and I say go and then for a minute and a half that room fills up with bright eyes and connection and laughter and they're trying to solve something but there's no right answer and they feel part of a bigger process of other people trying to figure it out as well and all ideas are welcome and I always make the point of saying when I look around the room and you're doing that there's a kind of a dynamism in the space like people are just bright and it's like really good fun and people are laughing and they say that's what this needs to feel like that's what that's what doing this stuff needs to feel like it's what the next 15 years when we look back on it will need to have felt like if we're actually going to do that so absolutely imagination is is essential to rapid transition and us doing it in the time we need to i think fantastic um and do you think trying to paraphrase one of the questions here which i think is really interesting and certainly relevant to stuff we do in tooting which is do you think that's the preserve of a sense of privilege of people who have time to do it of people who are aware of it you know how does this relate to reaching underserved communities if you like reaching people who are perhaps don't have any time to engage on the level that everyone on this call is perhaps privileged to do so whether by intent by squeezing it around work and family and whatever else uh, yeah, there was, it was kind of when I interviewed Robert McFarlane, who is just amazing, who wrote Landmarks and Underland and stuff. He said at one point, uh, imagination is a function of privilege uh, in that it needs space and it needs time and it needs us to not feel under constant surveillance. It needs us to not feel in a, in a state of acute anxiety and uh, an acute stress and distress. And that's not to say that, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, people who are really struggling are, are incapable of imagination, clearly not the case. But actually, if you want to create the best conditions for the imagination to flourish, uh, you don't create um, the kind of conditions that we've created for the, for, for the, for the poorest people in, in the UK in 2019, um, uh, which is why universal basic income, I think we should be looking at as being an imagination strategy it's a policy for reclaiming our collective imagination it gives it space it gives it time to breathe um uh you know it's it's it was it really struck me at, at one point when i was researching it that i was reading about how in the 60s and 70s the whole generation of uh, of working class people who for the first time could go to university and who went to art school and all those people like Brian Ferry and Vivian Westwood and John Lennon and um, the people who, who went to art school, who were able to go to art school. Uh, and, you know, so much of the punk movement and the po political movements around that time all came out of the art schools. Uh, now going to art school is, is becoming again the kind of preserve of the privileged. If you go into most state funded schools, there are some really passionate, dedicated art teachers who are working so hard with very, very little. We have an education system that is trying to drive the arts out altogether from, you know, we want to go to have the English baccalaureate where there is no space for arts subjects. It's English, maths, science, uh, you know, technology, those kind of things. There's no room for, for the arts at all. And uh, whereas if you, go into, if, if you go into the private sector, private schools have amazing art rooms and they really value theatre and drama because they see that's how you create really rounded, uh, imaginative creative people but somehow we seem to feel like in the state sector it's just something that we need to to get rid of so absolutely you know we need to be uh, as somebody said uh, you know th 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 when I said about how I got rid of my phone for a year that's really hard it used to be that having a smartphone was a function of privilege now a lot of people on the lowest incomes can't do their job without what without the idea that you might give up your smartphone for a year people like that's just ridiculous so 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 it's it's why i f i feel like that idea of a national imagination act is so brilliant it's, it's, it's so exciting because actually it means that you say this matters for everybody and we have to create the conditions for everybody to be imaginative because otherwise we're really in trouble it makes me think of what you said about the hippocampus as well you know stressed communities reduced hippocampus reduced ability to imagine and so on yeah, there's a there's a guy who I interviewed uh, who was called um, Dr. Gordon Turnbull, who was the guy who um, uh, he was a guy who wrote a book called Trauma, and he was a he was the guy who pioneered 
the idea of um, uh, of post-traumatic stress disorder. So he he developed uh, trainings for the British Army for on on PTSD for for soldiers who were coming back. Um, but I can't find it anyway. So so he he said something about how um, uh, about how when you have an organisation that is under a huge amount of stress it creates such an impact on the hippocampi of the people who work in that organization that it's really hard. He talked about the NHS. He said, you know, in the NHS, people are just absolutely stressed. The whole, that whole system is stressed beyond words. And I, a while ago, I, I presented kind of a talk very similar to the talk I gave here to uh, an event which was producers from across the arts. So they were uh, in in theatre, or they were the managers of theatres, or touring companies, or orchestras, or whatever, who came together for a week to just sort of breathe and share ideas and share best practice, or whatever. And I did this talk, and I spoke to a woman afterwards who runs a big theatre in Bristol, and she said, "In my organisation, everybody, from the people at the top, the senior managers, down to the guy who opens the curtains on the stage, on the stage, are so totally frazzled and burnt out and exhausted." that uh, we're all just running on fumes. And she said, and we're responsible for the kind of imaginative life of the city. And we're all completely fried. You know, so actually, if we were to collectively value creating the, the circumstances and the conditions for the imagination to flourish, we would do things so differently from, from how we do things today. Kind of comes back to that uh, urgency game as well, doesn't it? That kind of rapid transition idea. If you leave out any space to look after yourselves or your communities, then you're kind of doing it for a kind of crazy reason in a way. Yeah, totally, totally. Just wanted to come on to, there's loads of questions about kind of wider engagement, I guess, how this feels for communities on the ground and how yeah, this, I guess the state of transition today, one of them was really interesting question, really related to one of the areas of the book that you, you highlighted, which was should transition be introduced to kids in primary schools? Which I thought it was a lovely question, you know, how would that, how, how do we get this practice in schools, do you think? Uh, I think you, um, there's an amazing woman I met when I came, I did a talk in uh, for Transition Kentish Town a little while ago in London. And there was a woman there who runs a doctor's practice in Kentish Town who was trying to make her, who loves transition. And she is basically trying to turn her doctor, her GP's practice into a transition GP's practice. So they have food growing in the yard outside. They have a craftivist exercises instead of magazines in the waiting room. Uh, and she's doing all kinds of stuff. She's just absolutely brilliant. And she's taken the, um, the essential guide to doing transition and she's using it to create uh, uh, a guide for for other GPs practices to become GPs practices based on the essential guide. She's just amazing, and uh, uh, and and I kind of feel like you could see the same sort of thing happening in primary schools. You know, primary schools should be resourced in such a way that they become a showcase of transition, so that actually uh, uh, just everyday life that that's kind of what it's like you know i remember going to visit the crystal palace transition town food market which won all these amazing awards in london fabulous food market they created there and i said why do you do this and they said because we want our children to grow up thinking this is normal you know and actually it should be that that, that education experience of being part of education is one of it feeling completely normal that you live in a school where food grows everywhere and you go out and you do some of that and I went to a school in Germany that I talk about in the book where they had they had had an, a used to have a paddock next to the school which they bought and they just turned it into a wildlife area and I talked to their teacher she said I said how do you how do you make use of it she said when we do maths and they need to calculate the circumference of a circle they go out and they measure the trees when they're doing German and they're writing creative essays they go out and sit in the forest they go out and sit in the garden. When they're doing art, they go out and sit in the garden. You know, you, you use that kind of landscape and that world around the school to underpin everything. It should just run through it. You, you can teach all that stuff and use the garden as a, as a, as a and, and, and use the school as a place to do that. So for me, it should be just, that's just how it is. And then by the time, and, and using the community around it as well. There's a guy I speak to in the book in, in India who runs a thing where they, uh, called the uh, um, 
something university where they basically uh, use the town and, and the city that they're in as the as the learning resource they say you know what people say in india that we have a crisis of, of, of teachers we don't have enough teachers he said what are you talking about we live in a city full of amazing mechanics and basket makers and and, uh, and 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 coders and chefs and all kinds of people you know we use that as a resource and we send the kids out and we make use of what we have around us and we learn from what we already have so yeah i i, I can't wait for that debate you know when when sir ken robinson when tony blair was elected one of the first things he did was get sir ken robinson to write this incredible report all about how to make our education system more uh, more more uh, imaginative and creative and it's brilliant you can still find it online you can read it and they just said thank you very much and just stuck it straight straight on the shelf you know you could uh, you could just blow the dust off that and just roll that out through the education system tomorrow morning really i mean it makes me think as well about how slowly but surely change happens so i have children in a primary school live in southwest london wasn't part of the Extinction Rebellion activism myself in the April uprising, but very much supported it from afar. I didn't feel like the best place for my energy. Heard about the uh, trees on Waterloo Bridge, the garden bridge that was popped up by communities across London mm -hmm. and way beyond in the April uprising. And the fact that a lady called Mal Gilchrist was just put her hand up and said, I'm gonna get all of those trees in the ground, but not all in one go, we're going to get one tree paired with one place. So little did our headmaster know that he was part, headmaster of my kids' primary school know, that he was part of the Extinction Rebellion protest because one of those rebel trees is in our playground. And he quite likes that, but he doesn't want the school associated with Extinction Rebellion because that's not the role of the school there. So it makes me think about like how we, bit by bit, work with the institutions that we've got around us, work with our schools, uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's it feels like that's the community relevance. Perhaps that's the relationships that we have as transition towns up and down the country. Yeah, I, I, I love that that idea of of how do we how do we turn places into what if places? You know, it's like I, there was a, just a thing I read recently. I, I'm in, in in my town. I'm very involved. I'm one of the, the founders of a brewery, the New Line Brewery, and, and we just did a, a whole community crowdfunder to expand what we did called lion share which any of you who follow me on social media will know i was just going on and on and on and well it's finished now so you won't have to hear about it anymore and uh, and i read recently about a, a, a brewery i think it was in london who had who did register to vote sessions in the brewery i thought it was a brilliant idea you know you have you have a brewery and you have a bar in the brewery and when you go in you know and just checking everyone's everyone's registered to vote you know it's because there's an election coming up and you know, so so even just a space like a brewery, we can start to look at as a what if space. You know, what could happen in here? Always having that question about you know what could happen here, uh, what what what, you know. So it's 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 a uh, it's that thing of sort of holding that space open for possibility. I think. I guess it's that coupled coupled with this idea of organisation or practical carbon reduction or it's like these things need to sort of sit alongside each other be partner to each other be porous so that uh, the imagination can bleed into all of these very practical solutions that i i hear and i'm sure and obviously you do in the books and the, the experiences that you have you see up and down the country and way beyond um just wanted to think a little bit about uh some of the barriers to that and how we sort of dance around them or learn how to dance around them there was questions around like the current sort of um, atmosphere or the current organization of land ownership. You know, how do we get things going? Or, you know, the revolutionary governments that you talked about in the presentation. You know, how do we start engaging with our local authorities in a sort of peer to peer way in the UK, as opposed to, you know, they have all the power, therefore we must go cap in hand to them? How do you see stuff like that starting to? Yeah, starting to play, starting to be able to dance with those structures that, that perhaps are barriers to scaling up what we're doing as transition town. I think um, I think we're living in a time where things are changing so much faster than we might allow ourselves to imagine they are. I think you know, it feels to me like since April and since those since that kind of extinction rebellion, the first re rebellion week in april it feels like the the tectonic plates deep under our feet are finally starting to shift 
and you know all of the different uh, local governments all across the country who were declaring a climate emergency, which I would never have imagined that happened six months ago you'd have said you know 50 60 percent of local governments in the uk are going to declare a climate emergency that's really and actually now we're in that place where they're doing that and then they're going okay so now what do we do and that's opening up that space and it's opening up that invitation you know here in devon devon county council really conservative initially they resisted it they said oh well, well and then they said oh well, well we, won't, we won't put a date on it which is like saying oh my roof's on fire i must call the fire brigade sometime and then they said 2050 which is like saying yeah my house is on fire i'll call the fire brigade in a couple of weeks you know they've now they're, they're now said it's 2030 they're doing this incredible sort of process they're putting resource behind it you know it's like things are starting to shit and really interesting conversations are kind of starting to open up that were really not happening before and lots of transition groups experience now is that people are saying so who's been thinking about this for the last 10 or 12 years and you know all that kind of work like the energy descent plan that we that we did here and that kind of stuff is really becoming kind of valuable we're seeing places where people who are very active in transition are are um are running for government and getting involved in government in in belgium the woman who was very active in in, in transition who is now the environment minister in belgium looking at putting funding into into the rollout of transition across belgium because they're they're talking about transition as being an environmental strategy part of a co2 reduction strategy part of a public health strategy <coughs> part of a mental health strategy you know, they're there because the transition groups have been working so hard and really putting these ideas out. They're starting to see and get politicians now who are starting to think in that joined up kind of connected way that is really integral to transition and, and, and to what we do and to how we do it. So, so you know, there's get involved in politics if you're somebody who, can, who, who feels like you can do that. But also never underestimate the power of that sort of working and, 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 and creating new stories on the ground at, at this time when those stories are all kind of starting to change and that, and the awareness is building so, so fast and working with young people who are coming through the climate strikes and who are, um, you know, there's some of those like in, in, in the youth strikes, so much of the narrative and the, the, the demands of the youth strikes are all things that are given away to other people to do. The government must do this and they must do this and they must do this. And yet, of course, it's absolutely important that they do those things. But there's that bit about, OK, what can you do what can we do i think it'd be lovely if, if not that it's anything to do with me because i'm 50 but actually you know if if, if actually uh if, if the school strikes had the week one week where they would one month where they would go on and do a strike and do all that stuff but then if the other month they would go and do something and create something on their own terms it doesn't matter what anybody else does if they go and plant loads of trees or make gardens or go and clear something up or you know go and do something like that i think that would be beautiful as well so that's quite interesting as well. We talk a lot, of course, on this call about transition towns, but the collaboration with other groups feels important too. Have you seen that in your journey writing the book? Have you seen those kind of collabor collaborations from transition yeah. towns with others? Yeah, I have. And I, 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 I see the, um, you know, I was up in London in October for the Extinction Rebellion couple of weeks up there I was in Trafalgar Square every other person I met was like hi we're transition West Kirby hi we're from transition wherever you know it was like there were loads of transition people there with their sort of putting their different hats on and their XR hat and their transition hat and uh and and that's that's fantastic I think um I mean one of the things that that that, that was really kind of intriguing to me was an event that we put on in Totnes a couple of weeks ago no a couple of months ago when was it just before the summer uh, July we did an event that was called Totnes declares climate emergency what next and it brought together the transition uh, transition town Totnes and the local extinction rebellion uh, group and various other organizations as well in the town the town council who had declared a climate emergency and the bit that was really interesting to me was how do we explore the bit where transition meets extinction rebellion because because the narrative that the, the, the kind of although the sort of uh, underlying aim is kind of similar that the narratives are quite different so if there was a spectrum from hope to hopelessness um xr is much further along the hopeless 
sort of part of the narrative and transition is often not always but you know further along the hopeful maybe we could do something sort of side of things you know if you're very sort of deep adaptation you're way way down on the hopeless kind of bit of it you know so it's kind of a spectrum and actually what was really interesting in designing that event was it was one of the first things i've been to that really held that whole spectrum that wherever you were on that spectrum you weren't feeling oh this is this is a bit too like that for me, or this is a bit too much like that. It's kind of held the whole thing. Uh, and that was, uh, so Ruth Bentovin was part of organizing that. And there was a whole t team of people who designed that. And one of the ways it did that was that we had, uh, in the part of the facilitation we did, we had provocateurs who came in and they were asked two questions. There were seven provocateurs. So they were people who worked with uh, refugees and asylum seekers in the town. People, they were someone from the youth strikes there was uh, someone who was an expert on rivers and water. There was somebody who talked about energy and transportation, these kind of things. First thing they were asked was, uh, where would, where would, what would it look like in 20 years if we did nothing? And then the second thing was, what would it look like in 20 years if we did absolutely everything we could possibly do? And uh, so it kind of, it, 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 it felt like it held that whole spectrum. And actually, so on, um, uh, on the Transition Network website, there's a there's a blog about that, and there's a guide you can download about how we how we did it and what we learned from that. So so there, there's hope there hopefully be some really interesting insights for anybody who wants to put on an event like that. Brilliant! I can see the chat. The Zoom chat is 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 on fire. So I encourage you to have a little read through that and have a look at that. I can't see it and concentrate, so I have no idea what's going on there. Yeah, and I'm going to, um, I'll save that chat window too. So we have about 10 minutes, 15 minutes left on the call. Just wanted to open it out. If there's burning questions, uh, perhaps we'll take them in, in, a, in twos or threes. But yeah, just pop your hand up if you have a question and I'll just sort of direct us through that for Rob. Is that him, isn't it? It's our eyebrows. Oh. Is anyone or or indeed anything in that Zoom chat that is particularly pertinent? Francine, uh, Francine, do you want to ask your or give us your reflection? Yep, you're unmuted now. Go ahead, Francine. Unmuted, but immutable. That's interesting. So, Francine, I'm afraid we can't hear you. Would anyone else like to come in? Hilary? I can say that Francine has been um, putting a lot in the chat window about Glasgow next year um, and maybe we could be doing uh, the COPs differently in terms of getting more things like this where lots of people are engaged in it. I mean I'm, I'm paraphrasing Francine and I'm aware that you can't, you seem to not be able to be heard but that's, there's a lot of, um, maybe um, Rob could have a look at it later, lots of comments about um, how we could be doing things like COP differently. Mm. <clears throat> I mean, it'd be interesting, Rob, to, yeah, Francine is still trying. Francine, just, if you can get your sound working, just pop yourself on unmute or give us a little flag or something and we'll try and, we'll try and do that, okay? Yeah, still can't hear you. We'll put the question or type the question in and I'll read it out. And yeah, that's a good idea. But Rob, how, what's your reflections on the COP processes and how, what we've just explored sort of relates to, relates to these international meetings? I went to the one in Paris and uh, uh, the famous one in Paris. Uh, you'd kind of you'd kind of wonder how anybody could have any kind of imaginative thought in that place at all, really. You know, it was it was like uh, uh, I don't know. It was it was not conducive. You know, so so you have the you have the main bit and then you have the kind of. I can't remember what they call it, which is basically the fringe, where they stick all the activist interesting groups over in another space over to one side where they can't actually do much to interfere with the actual process. 
And we had a transition network, had a small group who went there and we were in this place that was called Place to Be, which was the kind of an alternative media sort of center place, which just seemed to be loads of people who just spent the whole thing on sitting on their laptops tweeting. And there were people there from all over the world and we didn't get to do any sort of chatting with each other or hanging out with each other, where are you from? Or it just, it was all rather strange. So actually for me, the, the, the best, the most imaginative spaces at COP were, were the big, were the demonstrations, were the public events, where they tried to make a whole ring of people around a particular part of Paris, or it was that, those kind of um, sort of occupied sort of spaces of resistance that were the most interesting bits. I mean, the conference, you, you, you'd, you'd wonder how anybody could even have a single imaginative creative thought in the place at all, really. Um, perhaps with all of the, um, the stuff we've talked about, this <laughs> Extinction Rebellion Action, Transition Town Action, all the examples in, that you've talked through in the presentation, this is what kind of encourages governments to have the confidence to make change happen. You know, all that bottom up stuff. Um, yeah, but, uh, and isn't that how it's always been? I mean, that, that's, that's the, that's the, um, you know, that was what really blew, like I mentioned the story of Liège, you know, it was a thing that really blew me away in Liège chatting to the mayor. I'm, the mayor, so the mayor of Liège was called Willy de Mayer. I loved it. He was called, hey, you the man? No, you the mayor, Willy de Mayer, the mayor. And he, and we had breakfast in Willy de Mayer's uh, office. And he was, uh, he was, he was like, we couldn't have come up with this. You know, this, this, this was an idea that had to come from people. And for the first couple of years, we thought they were all mad and it wasn't going to happen. And then we realized actually this was brilliant. And, and our, that our role was just to get out of the way. So it's like, that's that's how change can happen where it just you 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 start to change the narrative a place tells about itself i thought i was so powerful being there fantastic um i just see that francine has popped something in the chat window here which i'm just going to read and francine you'll have to nod if this is your was what you were trying to get across <laughs> to, re to reduce carbon emissions climate commitments should be held online Question mark. Still time to do that this year rather than relocate to Madrid. Be a good example. I think it's I think it's related to the fact that we should use the opportunity of it not being held in Chile rather than move it necessarily. We should why not, why aren't we doing it online? You know why are we um, yes. Yeah, those that, that <laughs> kind of other... assuming that it has to move to Madrid. Let's do it online instead, and if not, definitely in Glasgow. <laughs> yeah i think the uh, as a as a as a committed non-flyer i'm always fascinated by these ways now that people increasingly can do bigger and bigger events online in a way that is actually quite satisfying um and um you know people like kevin anderson and academics who are saying we that we're not going to fly anymore and who are designing conferences that are all online and uh, and, and how all of that happens is is just wonderful to see how how quickly that is moving. So you could potentially have a really satisfying, productive uh, online COP twenty one that nobody flies to. Uh, maybe that maybe that should be the next one. And in the meantime, we'll all keep working away in our communities, making the change really happen step by step. Hey, um, yeah, yeah, because because that that is you know it's, it's the thing I was it's the thing of. When I was researching this book and when we did the 21 stories of transition book that some of you might remember from a couple of years ago and uh, you know when you go out and you start looking for stories of great things happening there is so much happening so much like if we could we could every every day the news could have different stories of great stuff happening all across this country and all the projects that you guys are doing in the places where you live and projects that you know of where you live you know, if it would be so different if actually those were the stories that we heard every day instead of the sort of drip, drip of kind of, no, it's all too late and you're too small and inconsequential and of course you can't change anything. And da, 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 da. you know, tell those stories, get those stories out absolutely everywhere. They're just, it's why, you know, in, in France, those of you who saw that French film Tomorrow, you know, which was just basically a whole collection of brilliant stories of, of ordinary people doing it incredible stuff all over the place that film 
in France had the and in Belgium the most phenomenal impact in a way that I think here it's almost impossible to understand it ran in mainstream cinemas for five months and grew and grew and grew and grew and I go to places where every politician in that town has seen it and loves it and has the DVD and shows it to all their friends you know and actually you, I really got a sense of how powerful that is and how how little we do that and if we can do that it makes it'll make such a difference sorry Hilary we're finally showing it in Tooting on Saturday afternoon. So if anyone's within um, shouting distance of Tooting, 2.30 p.m., um, it's, it's up everywhere on our uh, Twitter and website and Facebook. Great. Oh, it's brilliant. There's a shameless, shameless pitch at the end of our call <laughs> there. Uh, um, yeah, hey, it's nearly, it, <laughs> nearly 9.30, so I feel like um, I just want to yeah. say a really big thank you to Rob and to all of you for being on the call. Um, you're welcome to pop your mics off mute and just say a big thank you and perhaps we should we should close it up there um, I'll save the chat window uh, this call is being recorded so I'll send you all links of this recording as well um, so you can share it or reflect on it in time but yeah pop your mics off mute it'd be great to see your voices for a second here thank you Rob thank you very yeah. much thanks Rob thank, thank you. you thanks thank both you to guys. Rob and to Richard for organizing it oh, no, no. It's Great. Yeah, brilliant. And a tara from Tooting. Here they are, the Tooting Peeps. Bye. Brilliant. Really hope to see some of you at some point in the future. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks a million, Rob. Fantastic. Amazing. Okay, a million folks. Bye bye.